Yeah, I'm from, from originally from New Zealand, so my accent might be a bit weird to some of you. Um, and I'm now living in Tasmania and have been since 2016, which is a wonderful place. And I'm going to show you a map of um, Tasmania on my next slide and show you a little bit about where I'm from. But um, I'm not really going to be talking about a current study or some data because my talk is really around the idea of what I've been thinking of solutions for out of field teaching. And in Tasmania in particular, we've got a lot of remote areas, a lot of teachers in small schools who could really need some support. And I've been doing a number of projects around video work uh, since 2009 in Auckland University. And this has been progressing and it started me thinking about how we might use this to support teachers for professional learning, which builds nicely on what you were just talking about, Jared, because a lot of the frameworks that we use could benefit from that PCK framework of yours. And it feeds, I think, into your talk, Fiona. So well done on positioning these three talks so well, Linda. I think they sit together nicely. So um, just a few uh, issues or perspectives from the Tasmanians. There's a map of Tasmania there, little island at the bottom of Australia, for those of you who are unaware where it is. And um, like many parts of Australia, Tasmania has got many small, rural, remote, regional schools. And, but unlike a lot of Australia, historically, many of these have stopped at year 10. And we actually only have in Tasmania eight college, well, up until a few years ago, we only had eight colleges at years 11 and 12. So a lot of our students had to move. So there's some issues with that. There was transition challenges. Many students didn't continue after year 10, especially evident in the lower socioeconomic and rural areas. And really weirdly for you know many many people to understand i think it's only been compulsory for year 12 from 2020. um a few specialist teachers in a lot of our rural schools uh either in one either in one school or with an easy travel for teachers to share practice or to dis difficult to establish a school cluster for professional learning so in the city and the and the city areas of tasmania we have a lot of schools who group together in clusters and they, they get together for professional learning, but that's very difficult in the, in the rural areas. Um, Mountain Heights School, which is one I've got on the map there in Queenstown, it's 3.5 hours from Hobart and Launceston, and it's almost an hour from the nearest high school. So there's lots of primary school, there's a few smaller primary schools in the area, but no high school or district school. So it's a long way for anyone to, to travel in terms of getting together. Um, alongside that, our Department of Education has been in an initiative to try and get more students to carry on into, into years 11 and 12. They've been introducing all our high schools, they've been extending them to years 11 and 12, so that now almost all our high schools have years 11 and 12. This is a real issue because a lot of our teachers are not trained to that level. And, and even worse in the schools which were out of area to start with, and some of those teachers were struggling to get up to year 10. And now they've been asked to teach to year 11 and 12. So there's a real issue there. Um, combined with, and this is a, a, an issue we've talked about often in, in, in the forums, is there's no data or data for OEFF in, in Tasmania. Um, it's either not collected or it's not available. Um, I think there's a reluctance on the part of schools and, and, and even our departments to, to reveal what the levels of OOF might be. I mean, if you're a principal of a school and you say, how many teachers have you got teaching out of area? Um, saying that you've got a lot speaks, could speak very negatively about your school and the quality of your school and the way that that's grabbed in the media. Um, some past examples of this, for, um, this, is from, <laughs> this is very old, but in some ways I think it's got worse because we're training less teachers in mathematics here in, in, in Tasmania. And uh, you know, as I said, the extension to years 11 and 12 has meant that there's a demand for more teachers. So I think the situation might be getting worse. But if you look at this one here, just to, this might surprise you in terms of the state, the proportion of 20 to 20 year old, 24 year olds carrying on and getting at least a year 12, um, Tasmania is the, um, the second worst state in, in Australia. And reporting on this study, which does have some data. And I, I tried to find a study in Tasmania that had more recent data than this. I searched and searched and searched and couldn't come up with anything. So this, is, this goes back to 2009, three schools. And look at that one at school B, only 25% of the students in year 10 carried on to year 11. And 
now we're trying to introduce those schools to have year 11 and 12 to try and retain some more of those students, but we're not doing a lot to help the teachers in those respects. So on the basis of my video use, um, I've started thinking about how we might use videos to support these teachers in these remote areas. And um, five dimensions for video use, which I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides. What's the purpose? Who watches the video? What's being watched? What framework has been used for the watching? And, and Jared, your um, core framework is one of those. I'm not actually gonna talk about that, but then you've done it already, so I don't need to. And who leads and guides the use of the video? Some other questions that might be associated with that. Um, if they're going to be doing it, what might they gain from watching videotape lessons? Are either teachers unknown to them or teachers that they know or close colleagues? How is work on the video guided? What frameworks are used? And some practical and ethical considerations. And these ones, the practical and ethical considerations is a real challenge that we've been coming up against as we, as we explore what we might do and how we might develop this research project. So that's what I'm hoping we might get some discussion around today. So I'm just gonna put, put these all up. These are uh, one, two, four, five uh, common uses of videos um, or, or benefits of them, the purposes of them to enhance reflection of their practice, uh, to promote uh, mathematical knowledge for teaching and that, that teasing off between content knowledge and PCK that uh, Jared alluded to before. Um, what we call video stimulated recall, where you look at the video and try and recall what you were thinking in the moment, what that meant for your teaching. The idea of establishing a community of practice, which is one of the aims that I would be looking to achieve as far as doing this project would be to establish a community of practice online because it's difficult to have that community of practice in a practical, in a real sense, when you're so remote. And the last one I put up there, not because it's anything that we're trying to do, but it's a caution really, because as soon as you start using videos, and there have been quite a lot of examples of this, um, it can be used for evaluation or measurement. And there are a lot of the frameworks that have been sort of grabbed by authorities to do just that. So it's a bit of a caution, really. Um, Pre-service education, which is not really what we're talking about here, is a, but it's been one of the more common uses of videos. Um, it's also been used within a school. And again, that's not what I'm talking about here, but it's been used quite successfully within schools uh, to look at their own practice within a community of practice in that school. The teacher leaders one, which is again, what I alluded to before. And the one that I'm really thinking about more here is that idea of mixed participants, teachers from different schools um, in the form of a co-learning or a community of inquiry. And that might be linking up a out of field teacher in a small rural school with a really uh, highly more experienced teacher in the field in, in a city or anywhere really, because when you're online, it doesn't really matter where you are. Um, some frameworks that I have been uh, playing around with and been using, um, the resources orientation and goals. I don't know whether you're familiar with those that uh, Sean felt uses. And Jared, again, this comes back to something you said about the idea of reducing your prompts um, most of the ones here have reduced them to, to, to less than what you were talking about. The, the uh, Schoenfeld one just has the three, the resources, orientations and goals. Choi, who's been built on the work of John Mason, has developed a three-point framework uh, where he looks at the planning, the delivery and the review, and he just poses three questions. Beswick and Muir in their supportive classroom reflection also use three little questions to look at the practice. So they just narrowed it down to three that they could actually look at. And the video LM framework um, in Israel, which um, I'm sure some of the people here are familiar with, um, had six that it looked at. The um, six lenses that they viewed the lessons across. Um, some issues of agency, ethics and practicalities. Um, it's very important. All studies identify the idea of trust and the fact that the teacher needs to be at the center, the teacher needs to have control. You can't impose it from somewhere else. Um, there's an issue of who can see the video. If, I, if a teacher videos their practice in the classroom and then shares it with someone else, and that leads into the idea of the ethics as well. And this is something we haven't really conquered yet or really, really worked our way through. If, if a teacher videos their practice and shares it with someone else, um, what do we do if it shows the students? 
Now, um, this is not a research project we're talking about here. We're talking about a way of, of continued and developing professional learning for teachers to support them. In a research project, it's a bit simpler because you develop an ethics, you get, your, you get all your forms signed. But if the teacher's going to do this on a regular basis, it, it, it um, poses issues of ethics. Practicalities, who does the recording and how? In, in the research project that I've been involved with, we've just put a camera in the corner of the classroom. And you know, the camera was bought out of the research project. But if we're going to do this on a more on a wider scale, and especially in small rural schools that have limited budgets, limited numbers of people to actually do the videoing, how might we achieve it? And then a, another question or practical question, or more of an academic question really, is a lot of the studies that have done videos indicate that when you start analysing them, the teachers tend to focus on either classroom management type things or pedagogical issues. And what we're really trying to turn the, the lens on is that kind of content knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge and the interplay between it. So how you get them to focus on that and draw those out is a practical question. So um, I think I've finished in, within the time frame. I've got some, ref I don't know whether you're going to collect the PowerPoints from these, Linda, and post them, but I've got some references there to the ones I've talked about. Um, I really wanted to finish reasonably quickly because I'm really interested. I think this talk leads nicely, Linda, into the transnational um, research component tomorrow. Um, I've, I've talked to Linda and a few people here about the idea of developing this as a research project um, to see how we might do it, to see how we might encourage uh, teachers to share videos and develop their own professional learning. So that's where I'm interested in heading and I'm happy to discuss here any questions you might have about that or ways you think we might develop it or ideas or suggestions from those who are present who have already tried some of this because you know it's, it's always it's difficult to know what everybody's doing 